All right, guys, welcome back to the Canadian Real Estate Homefront Podcast. This is episode 52 to the guy on King Street who said he loved our podcast to me uh, on Saturday after the lease lost. Thanks for supporting me. You made me Cortez look very cool loves, in front of my friends. <laughs> he loves when people notice him in the streets. I wish I was he, more famous. He calls me every time. He's like, hey, guess what? <laughs> no, I texted you, guess what? And you called me right away as if I had something cool to say. Yeah, and he's like, cool. somebody recognize me. <laughs> this is what it was about. <laughs> Anyways, guys, this has been 52 awesome episodes oh, 52 officially one year yeah we haven't really hit one well we were longer than a year because brooke likes to take weeks off because she's <laughs> sick or she needs a nap so yeah we don't always get it done but we started at the beginning of april last year so we're 13 months in so that would mean that we're five episodes behind yeah yeah and we five weeks off in one year that's not that bad that's not too bad Realtors no. have to have their vacation time too yeah and we don't film remote so obviously like it would be easier if we did yeah but anyways, if you are new here or you're a veteran here, if you'd like the free content that we put out, you can book a call down below. It's absolutely free if you want to buy or sell, and we'd be happy to chat with you. But let's get into the first topic. Brooke, take us away. Take us away. Okay. Canadians put off plants. Wow, too many people are texting me. Canadians put off plants to buy a home until the Bank of Canada cuts rates. Already that's making me think of so many things to say. But um, a survey by the Bank of Montreal revealed this week that 72% of aspiring homeowners are waiting for the Bank of Canada to cut interest rates before buying. Canadians opting to wait for rate relief are up to 4% are up 4% from 2023 amid growing concerns about the cost of living, inflation and their financial situation, said Vimo. Among the almost 40% planning to buy a home in the near future, only 13% plan to buy in 2024, and 26% plan to buy in 2025 or later, the report said. Canadians are expecting a rate cut in the second half of this year, and that should bring some buyers back to the market and firm up sales, says Economist at BMO. Yeah, so it's it's interesting. Like, this is where it doesn't make a ton of sense because, like, if we get a rate cut in June by 25 basis points, it actually doesn't do much to your actual mortgage. Um, and that's only if you're going variable anyway. Like the fixed rate is already down pretty, like you can get a three year for about 5.2. Right. Something like that. Like I've actually heard someone get a 499, which was Yeah, pretty, pretty I saw impressive. one at 4.62. It must have. Uh, yeah, it must have been insured. No, in yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. The funny thing is that insured mortgages, if you put down less than 20%, you can actually get a better rate because it's insured. So yeah. that's the opposite thing you put down less than 20 percent, you get a better rate yeah but you're paying mortgage default insurance so i always recommend putting 20 percent or more and paying that tiny little difference in yeah. uh, interest i try to tell my buyers all the time but no one ever listens because it's just i don't know what no it one is. ever listens to cortez but it's like <laughs> uh, like if you're buying a home i'm like when christmas comes don't stop looking like when you get to November, December, yeah. like just keep looking because so many people yeah. take their foot off the pedal. I know there's not as many options, but if you can find something mm -hmm. in that time frame, like if you bought in November, December of last year mm -hmm. versus February or March of this year, you yeah. could have saved a lot of money, especially in Toronto yeah. uh, in terms of like what you could have purchased if you're right. buying like a, a detached or right. semi-detached because yeah. the market just picks up and it's like, when sellers wait, I was trying to time it with my sellers. Like, okay, we're going to sell next year. I'm like, let's get pictures you know, in summer or fall, so we have nice pictures and then yeah. let's go out in like February. Yeah. Cause there's not a lot of inventory. And that's when everyone says like when the new year yeah. comes, everyone's like, well, I need to find a house. I need right. to find a house. Yeah. And now what we're seeing, and we'll get into that more in the next article is an influx of listings hitting the market. Totally. And so, I mean, I wouldn't wait for the bank of Canada, like to sit around unless you literally can't qualify because you can't afford it. All right. If you can but afford the, it. The funny thing is, is that usually when there's some sort of rate cut, that puts fuel on the fire. So that brings out more buyers. Like if 26% are waiting for the rate cut, then the rate cut happens. And now there's more buyers. That's going to add more competition, right? For sure. So it's like a balancing act. Yeah. A little bit. Like, because when rates go is. down, prices tend to go up. You know, it, and it's not huge jumps like we saw in COVID. But when there's more people, it's a supply and demand issue. Yeah, and like speaking of rate cuts, uh, it's been like the worst <laughs> prediction ever. But uh, we did say that uh, there wouldn't be many this year. And I think that's coming to fruition more and more. But it looks like we've had another quarter of negative GDP per capita in Canada. Um, I was actually reading this morning that New York has a better GDP than Canada. Hmm. Like just New York. Hmm. It's wild. But uh, anyways, <sighs> so I think that Canada's economy is 
really slowing down. So Tiff Macklin might have to yeah. cut the rate in June uh, or he might wait another yeah. till the, ne- yeah, yeah. the next rate announcement. I think the economy is slowing down so much, um, but he has to be cautious because he doesn't want to import inflation. Like we've talked about it so many times right. from the States because it doesn't look like the U.S. No. and Jerome Powell is going to cut anytime soon. Right. So we have to, like we've said before, stay close to what the Fed is doing. Otherwise, we're literally importing inflation because yeah. our dollar, if it's weaker than our biggest trading partner, the States. Mm-hmm then our dollar doesn't go as far. So we're spending how much more? Yeah. And we pull some stats from, you know, I found the stat market analy- analytics tool from Broker Bay that I shared with you, <laughs> but it's just, it shows you the number of offers, the number of showings being booked and, and just month over month, the change that we've seen has mm-hmm. been pretty drastic mm-hmm. from uh, previous months. So yeah. the market is slowing down and I'm yeah. not the only one to say this. Um, and, you know, the condo market's definitely slowed. I feel like in Toronto, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's like the condo market's really slow, but the detached and semi-detached market is still moving, right? Because uh, there's still a lack of supply there. So it's like you have the same market, but two different but two markets. Two different, yeah. yeah, yeah. And same with Hamilton. You know, I'm noticing kind of well, similar d- it's things. different price points too, for sure. Very like different. that first uh, first house price point of like the six to seven hundred range; those go pretty quick in Hamilton. Hundred percent. And like I just sold a really cute, charming house in in Hamilton for six fifty. Like that's I know it was, it was only two bedrooms. Um, the basement was done. The basement was actually awesome. It had a bedroom and a bathroom mm-hmm. too, but it's 650. It's a starting point. You know, it's a wartime yeah, bungalow. Great. I I get it. Totally. Um, and like we say, like a lot of people who want to be in the GTA and not quite the GTA, H-A, you know, the greater mm-hmm. Hamilton. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a good point. Good, good place to totally. start and rent it out yeah. if, if you don't want to, don't want to live there and mm-hmm. you want to live somewhere over here. Obviously there's tax implications, but just be right. careful with it. And, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. You know what? I hear a lot of people say, okay, yeah, I want the rates to come down before I buy. And it's like, okay, so you're going on a variable. And they're like, no, I'm going on a fixed. And it's like, all right, let's back up there. I know. Because the Bank of Canada, whether or not they cut their rate in June, has nothing to do with the fixed rates. So if you're waiting for the Bank of Canada to cut the rates so that you can go ahead and get a fixed rate, that it does not make sense. It really does. It doesn't make sense at all. So the fixed rate is always going to be attached to the bond yield. So if you're planning to get a fixed rate, waiting for the Bank of Canada to drop their rates is not going to have any sort of overlap with your fixed rate that you could potentially get now versus June. Yeah, just watch the Canadian five-year bond yield if you want rates to drop. And then yeah. if, so if, if you going, see them yeah, dropping, yeah. then you kind of wait a couple of weeks and then the bank yeah. kind of adjusts with it. So um, If you want to get a fixed rate, don't wait for the Bank of Canada. You're waiting for the bond. Yeah, and there's better people to watch on this than us. It's just like we learn from like, you know, mortgage brokers online, a great example is Mark Mitchell. He's in line and I'm trying to get him on the podcast. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. He has, he has a good video, but he's actually talking about like TD has this, like their crazy variable rate yeah. where it's like prime minus oh, yeah, I saw that. more, but Mark, Mark is so intellectual where he, he points out that TD's prime rate is higher than all the other banks. Oh, ha. so it's like, even when you decrease it, it doesn't make much of a difference Yeah, yeah. because it's a higher prime rate. So it's like, yeah, you can take minus that, but it doesn't yeah, yeah. Really make much sense. But okay, let's pivot to the next one here. GTA home buyers had more choice in April as a new listing spike. Buyers have no shortage of options in Toronto real estate market this spring. According to the latest figures from Treb, April showers brought a slump in home sales compared to April of 2023. when there's a temporary resurgence in activity after an interest rate driven cooling following the city's red hot pandemic real estate market. The GTA reported 7,114 sales through the Trebs MLS system in April of 2024, down 5% to April 2023. This is the kicker. New listings were up by 47.2% over the same time period. Wow. So we had a surge of listings come to market. And I think it makes sense because the weather starts to get better. Yeah. People will be like, oh, let's take pictures. I'm seeing what my neighbor got down the road. Let's wait three weeks. It's probably going to still go. And then everyone piles on. Yeah. And now these offer dates aren't working as as they once did. That's the thing. It's like everybody, as a buyer, spring, like people that can't find a house right now that I'm working with, like nothing crazy in their little pocket that they want. It's like, and and this was a little while ago. It's like, wait for spring. There's going to be so many more listings to choose from. And then I just had that feeling that just wait for spring April because of the amount of conversations that I've had with even other realtors, other sellers. Oh, I want to wait for spring to sell. Yes. Historically, your house will typically do well in the spring or fall market. And especially with the weather, the, even the landscaping of selling in the spring, your house is going to show better. People are happier when it's sunny outside too. have the pool open. If you have a pool, 
But I think a lot of people waited where they would have normally just went to market. No, I want to wait for the spring market because they've seen historically that April and May over the past couple of years has been one of those months that things went crazy Mm -hmm. compared to a February of that year to April. The difference in sale prices were huge. It's kind of like when you have, you're holding that stock and it's like, it's at this ridiculous number. And then you're like, should I sell today? Like I'll wait a few more weeks. Yeah. And then then you lose it all. (laughs) You know, people start selling and taking profits and, um, it, you know, it's not quite the same, but it's, it's funny to see, right. It's that like human instinct to wait, maybe I can get more yeah. rather than just like, okay, there's so many people who will buy my house today. I think it's, um, a difference of personality too, because like I look at my mom and if my mom saw one, she would be like, oh my God, do it now. Like I take my money off the table. So she's very much of like, <gasps> take it off the table. Whereas a lot of people will make those bets of like, Mm, I think I can get more right and even even to sellers like historically your first offer will be your best offer yeah obviously you know I've heard people be like that that didn't happen to me I'm like you're kind of an outlier because I've seen it happen so many times yeah now I mean there's how many stories are going to contradict what I'm saying but it's like mm, like maybe I can get more we still have a lot of showings to have yeah um or to come through so it's about the risk of I always tell people to like, we try to go to market like I like Wednesday or Thursday. Right. And the reason why I like that is because like, if we get an offer quick, people are always like, well, like let's wait to the weekend. Like we have a few more showings on the weekend. I'm like, look, I've notified them. If they were serious, like yeah. they were like, cause people know almost before they walk into a house, they're going to put an offer on right. it because the pictures are so good these days. Um, if they were that serious and say we went on a Wednesday and it's like Thursday night and we have a good full price offer, and it's firm or whatever it might be, maybe one condition. And you want to wait till Saturday because you've got two or three showings. Like I just say, I would not do that if I were you because you don't know what they're going to offer. Like you have no idea. Yeah. And if they were serious enough, they would re- they would come and they would book earlier. The agent would be calling me and say, my guys love this house. Yeah. You know, is there a chance I can get in earlier? And I'd be like, yeah. for sure, go in yeah. and see it. Right. Yeah. So everyone gets notified when there's an offer. Curiosity kills the cat. Mm. <laughs> Words of Wisdom by Cortez this morning. <laughs> yes. Read the next one for us. This one's pretty wild. Is it? TD Bank. Oh, I saw this. TD Bank could face billions in fines following money laundering people. Probe. Probe. Oh, not people. people. <laughs> I was looking at you. I just saw Pete. Yeah. Like, that didn't make sense. TD could face billions in fines following money laundering probe. Canada's TD Bank may be facing billions of dollars in fines as Canadian and American regulators crack down on money laundering schemes that came to light over the past year. National bank analyst Gabriel Deshane said total penalty penalties for money laundering allegations could easily hit $2 billion. Currently, the U.S. Justice Department is investigating how Chinese drug traffickers allegedly used TD and other banks to launder at least $653 million in proceeds from fentanyl sales, including included by bribing the bank's employees to do so. Wow. Wild. Last week, FinTrack, Canada's financial crime watchdog, also issued a penalty against TD, this one amounting to $9.2 million, for failing to comply with anti-money laundering and terrorist financing measures. Among the violations, according to FinTrack, was that the bank did not report suspicious transactions that it had reason to believe were tied to illicit activity. TD had already paid the fine in full, according to FinTrack's statement on Thursday. Pretty crazy. So I was listening to an interview with um, the Looney Hour, and this guy Sam Cooper was talking about this, and he used to be a reporter for CBC. And he was saying that in Vancouver specifically, they're laundering money into there, like like fentanyl, um, these Chinese, I don't know what to Okay, wait. Them. Chinese is bringing fentanyl into? Vancouver. Okay. It's evident just by looking at their legal drug system that's completely failing. Um, and just looking at the streets, like Hastings streets, I watched a video on it on YouTube and I couldn't even believe my eyes how bad I wanna, it is. I wanna do that. I heard it's gotten worse. So because drugs are legal, legal. in Vancouver currently, yeah. yeah, that doesn't mean that you can import mass amounts of drugs from China. No, so they're importing they're import. This is what Sam Cooper said, and I'm paraphrasing it, but I was trying to understand it because I think it's mind blowing. Is that they're importing these these fentanyl drugs, obviously making a bunch of money, and then they're putting it into high rise real estate in Vancouver mm-hmm. and just parking the money there, and no one lives in some of these high rise condos. Like 
someone on Twitter was like, there's literally one light on in this whole, it was a low rise, but like, that's a lot of units. Um, so that's what they're, that's what Sam Cooper has proven. And, uh, even when I did a video on it, it was his actually article where the lady was making, she was a part-time hairdresser in Canada, but she was making over $500,000 back home. And she got a, she got a loan through HSBC. And it's just like, why would you be a part-time hairdresser if you were making $500,000 for a company in, in China? Right. So this is where it's like, okay, this is not adding up. And it's starting to get exposed through the banks where they're um, not doing a good enough job. Do you think that they were um, in on it or they were just being negligent? Sam Cooper was saying that some, he's proven that some politicians were getting paid off. Of course, that always happens. If if anybody thinks that the government and the, even just the municipal and provincial parties don't aren't incentivized by money and yeah. even just the even the contractors that get the city jobs like the bridges and the roads like who gets those jobs it's a bid system well it was like even with doug ford all of that stuff that came out that was yeah. wild as well yeah. so it's all there's all so much corruption when it comes to politics and how th- how things work that articles like this don't surprise me at all yeah but i think that some people that maybe are involved in this i think a lot of it was negligent because these people are smart like to launder money i don't like you gotta you gotta be smart to launder money first of all 100 and there's ways to do it where it can seem legit if you're getting a bank loan right yeah. so i think part of why fintrack is slapping these fines on is because the bank was being negligent not that everybody was corrupt behind the counter having in like a, a hand in it i yeah. think it was just negligence and the policies weren't being followed to a t that could have you it could have been caught if they were, but but it just wasn't. Hundred percent. Imagine you're a teller and you're making fifty grand a year. Yeah, you're just like and whatever. Someone offers you twenty grand on the table. You know, it's like that could be life changing for someone. I'm not saying like do that at all. Yeah, I'm and saying, it's probably like, more than twenty grand. That's the yeah, thing. Yeah, I know. If they're, it, it if could, they're talking about that much yeah. money in fentanyl, like think of how much drug money there is. That if you needed somebody on your side, a lot of people are like. Yeah, I, I think that the. What's going on in Vancouver is crazy, like all the drugs. And I'm going to I'm gonna look at the Hastings today. So I read a book called In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts by Gabor Mate. It is one of the best books to this day that I've ever read. And it's about the downtown east side in Hastings. This is very off topic. But it is so, like, you can, like, visualize the street. Um, and it is crazy how some people are living out there. And then because of the crisis of how expensive things are, if you look at, obviously, Hastings, you've said has gotten worse, but look at Hamilton driving down Main Street. I was blown away. I work in Hamilton a lot, but I do a lot on the Hamilton Mountain and Ancaster Dundas, um, Westdale. So downtown core Hamilton. I'm there often, just I guess I haven't been in the past, I don't know, month or so. And I was like, oh my God. Yeah. Holy moly. And sorry to keep rambling, but even the videos that we see on Instagram, I think I sent it to you of, um, this guy that goes around Toronto and interviews homeless people. And he's like, what got you here? Mm -hmm. And this girl was so like articulate. And she was like, yeah, like I lost my apartment because I lost my job. And now like, you know, we camp around in tents, but she just seemed like a normal human. Mm -hmm. And it broke my heart because I understand a lot of homelessness is mental health, which obviously still very much breaks my heart, but it's like your average citizen that was just very much working a normal job, had her own apartment and just simply is homeless because of the fact that our economy doesn't allow her to be able to afford anything if she's a single girl. 100%. It's just, I live in the city of Toronto and it's like every day when I go to the gym, I walk by this little, you know, this little homeless area where the same people have been and it's grown over time and, and it just, you know, it is what it is. And, And what you see people who have some drug addictions is they're very hunched over. It does something to their back. Yeah. Um, so you know it's not just alcohol or nope. anything. It's a very hard drug that changes the chemical imbalance of your brain. So to have that be legal in a city like yeah. Vancouver, even with David Is Eby, fentanyl legal? It's like they want to make it so the drugs are more controlled so they don't overdose. But the problem is, is that they're, set, they're going to get the drugs that aren't hard enough for them, right, they from the government. People addicted. Yeah, from the government, and they sell them, and they go buy the stuff that's harder illegally. So they're just putting more drugs on the street. Yeah, it's it's not working. And David Eby was he's the um, something of Vancouver, maybe the I've lost the word, but um, the premier of Vancouver, 
and he, LBC, he basically asked the federal government to pull back on, on their, their stance of having drugs legal because they want to do that in Toronto too. That's the next stance, yeah. And uh, Doug Ford's fighting it for sure. I think most people don't want it. Like, I, it's just, well, it's you, a failed experiment you because notice. you can smoke crack in, in, in parks and stuff oh like that. Oh my God. Well, like I was in Hamilton and outside on James Street, which is a popular street downtown. The people that were sitting outside, they didn't look right. And so just based on what you say with physiologically, what drugs do to you? Like the facial structure of somebody that smokes crack or meth or whatever they're smoking you become it becomes scary how much you just look like a very unwell person yeah. and then it's heartbreaking the scary thing is the unpredictability of somebody that's coming down off drugs or in a drug induced state psychosis um i'm not in support of that i understand the reason behind that because what what's the city or not the city the country like Netherlands or like some I think it was part Portugal. of Portugal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Portugal that legalized. That I think they had success, but I don't know for sure. I think that's why Vancouver adopted, but this was so long ago that Vancouver adopted it. Now it's just out of control. So I'm going to like actually post this podcast and I want to look at Hastings because I've been there myself. I, I saw like. Yeah, there's a people. YouTube video on it. This guy does a really good job. Um, I'll try and send it to you. Why do they amalgamate in Vancouver? The. Like what? the Hastings, like why is it so prevalent in I Vancouver? I think there's a, I think there's a direct line between China and Vancouver. Like I'm pretty sure when you have to fly there, yeah, go to Vancouver for. I think it's just an easier route of transportation. I could be wrong on that, but I remember somebody telling me that. So the drugs are coming from China. The fentanyl is, yeah. Fentanyl is scary. Yeah, I had scary. a cop friend that unfortunately had to go into this house where um the father or i guess the husband slash father had passed um and all four of them so it was two couples all like mid 40s the kids had gone to sleep they were neighbors then they had drinks together in the garage or whatever just normal and then somebody pulled out cocaine oh. and then all four of them did it so laced. again two couples oh, three of them lived and one of them died because of the fentanyl obviously there's no way to transperse it normally like it can be very potent in one section of the drug or whatever yeah. so one of them died and three of them lived wow that's horrible so it's literally russian roulette yeah it's it's lethal don't do anyways drugs, guys people. i just think Please. i know this is a real estate podcast but i think it's important to talk about it is important on, because you know? again it's affecting because it, it, it affects our world our real estate world essentially in the sense that and I'm not saying it in a way like, oh, you're affecting our neighborhoods and like no, bad no. on them. It's a crisis, obviously. How do we get these people help? Right. Yeah. It's more how about do how them do we help? get them help? Get into treatment centers. and Because like even look at downtown, nobody's buying like where there's these camps are growing, right? So it is affecting those areas a lot. Sure. Yeah. In terms of research. It's just, yeah, it's just about getting treatment. Like you need professional help at that point. And and we need to find ways to fund programs that help get people into these in these treatment centers rather than making it easier for people to access drugs. In my yeah. opinion. Essentially you know, we're right? saying, okay, let's make it legal so they don't overdose, but put more drugs on the street. Yeah. Instead of let's put those dollars into more treatment programs. I think six people die a day in Vancouver. Six overdose. people die a day. Yeah. Yeah. That's how bad it's getting. Just, just Vancouver alone. Just Vancouver, yeah. And that's yeah. just overdose. I'm, oh, I'm like not 100% sure, but I, the, the number <laughs> I heard, it was it was quite staggering to see that. It was on overdoses, yeah. So, anyways, I want to finish off on one good piece of news for renters because renters have been notoriously paying a lot of money on something that doesn't build equity. But in the GTHA, condo rents are down 7% in the past six months. Now, this is a drop in the bucket for how fast they've gone up, but still good news. In a region notorious for its high living costs, the first quarter of the year brought some relief for renters in the market for a condo in the greater Toronto-Hamilton area. According to new data from Urban Nation, condo rents in the GTHA slipped 7.4% in Q1 of 2024 to an average of still 27.32 per month. This follows a record high of 29.29 per month was in Q3 of 2023 and marks the largest six-month decrease in record during the past 15 years of data tracking outside the pandemic. So 
I saw, a post, I saw a post today that Pierre Paul, Polyev um, compared when he was the housing minister in 2015 and what two-bedroom apartments were on average in Canada compared to Trudeau. But it's like, okay, buddy, I understand what you're trying to do, but, like, that was 2015, like, before COVID. Mm. So I didn't like that post that he put out just because it's like, I understand inflation and everything that Trudeau's done and their money, monetary policies and everything has really made things unaffordable for Canadians. But also it's like, you can't compare your number <laughs> in 2015, buddy. Yeah. Stop it's, it. It's a that bit, was 10 years ago, pre-COVID. Bit, yeah. Well, COVID actually, r- rents went down because people would like- True. And in the people, city. A lot of people moved home with their parents. Yeah. So, like we actually saw like, you know, obviously since 2015, rents went up and then they came well, down. Well, in the heart of COVID, they went down. But now it's spiked up. So yeah. the consequences and what we're seeing now is still the repercussions of the pandemic, right? Like a lot of- like the, even the way the government's trying to claw back money in how they overspent and how many people got CERB that weren't supposed to get CERB. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. People are making more on CERB than what they were actually doing. Like they, they didn't have a job and all of a sudden they were getting 16,000 in two months or three months, whatever it was. Yeah. It's funny. Like I've been, I, I've been in the private lending, lending space for a while just to kind of pivot here. And I know you had those guys that kind of message us now and then about what we think about deals and stuff like that. Yeah. But it's crazy to see kind of like behind the curtains of like how much some people are struggling and like they're just hanging on by a thread. Oh yeah. Like I've, I've heard numerous people with B lenders and the B lenders won't renew. And that's where you can see a lot of trouble is the B lenders. I guess. Yeah. If you go with a B lender or a private lender. Yeah. They might not renew. Right. And, and the reason why. Any lender has to renew. The reason why, like when people hear how I can get 14% on private money. They're like, how is that possible? Like the banks only pay six, but you don't pay, like you're paying full interest to us. Yeah. You don't pay any principal. You're not paying any principal. So like, that's how the, that's how the rate can become 14%. People are in a bad situation where they need, they they, they need the money for something. Um, And then they have skin in, in the, in the game, in the home because they've got 20% or more down. So they want to hang on, but it can, it can hurt people. Right. And, and, uh, you know, I'm dealing with a situation right now where I have to sell this property for somebody because the B lender won't renew and, and the lawyer suggested to them that they sell ASAP, like get this thing done in ASAP and, and pay back the lender as quick as you can. So there are situations out there. It's that private market that I think is going to feel more pain rather than the, the I didn't know that B lender. lenders could just pull. Oh yeah. Yeah. I thought it was just the like private. No, B lenders can, they can, they can say, I'm not renewing. I mean, you can go look somewhere else if you want for another B lender. But if you know an A lender is not going to touch it, then you got to you gotta keep looking, right? So mm-hmm. the reason why I you can make such... I think that some of them do and some of them don't, maybe. Maybe, I don't know. I, I just know... Again, guys, this is the mortgage side of things. Mortgage this is side. why we work with very specialized people yeah. in the mortgage. A lenders are the bank and B lenders yeah. are like investors who are like willing to lend you money. Um, because they can't get money from the bank. And then, yeah, that's how you get a really good yield on your money is because they pay full interest. They don't pay any principal down. So, Yeah, it has got me into private lending too. I did my first private lend lending deal where yeah. I forked over some, some money. But you just got to get your, you just got to get your, only. in private lending, like I always recommend people. And I'm going to get the guy who sends me all the deals. I'm going to get him on the podcast to talk more about it. Who? Uh, his name's Av. He owns just a lending company and, um, Anyways, yeah, you just kind of got to get your feet wet. See if you like it. I like it. It's very passive. It's funny because some people are so risky. Like like my mom said, she, my mom said she'd take money off the table. She's like, do not give your money away. And it's like, okay, stop. Because it's a prom note, which is a promissory note, which essentially if all else fails, you're the last one. You don't get your money. Like there's. Yeah, there's usually a first on there, which is the bank. And then you're in second position. But what you always want to make sure is that the loan to value. There's enough. There's enough leverage. loan to value that if you had to sell it. You would still get paid out. Still get paid out. Because yeah. if somebody sold and you're in second or third position, a lender, or sorry, first place mortgage is getting paid out first, then second, then third, and then I even saw fourth last week. If like the first place is 95% of the, the, yeah. appra- the appraisal <laughs> of the home and yes. then you're going in and lending. Yeah, don't do that. Yeah, you're just that's your stupidity. So review it beforehand. Yeah. But these, these are just like little subsections of, of real estate that obviously- Yeah, there's different subsections. So yeah. Chat with you about- you Yeah, know? I wanted to get Ab on here because it's just a different vehicle where um, I feel like people can take 50 grand and they can put it 
into something that yields a little bit of money. And usually it's a one year term. make you like 60, 600 bucks a month. Yeah. Okay. So let's call it almost seven grand per year. And then you get your 50 K back. So essentially if you have some money sitting in the bank and you want to like just give 50 of it to make 600 bucks a month to pay for whatever, even I told my dad, I'm like, your line of credit is 5% and you have like a million dollar line of credit. I'm like, give me 500 of your line of credit at 6%. Yes. Yeah. But if you get 14% back, then you're lending somebody else's money you take the and making 7%. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's what I do. I take the spread on a lot. Of, it's I, literally got, a spread. It's not even his own money. Use yeah. your line of credit and private lend. It's just like if you have fifty grand and you're like, I want to get a car, and my car payment's six hundred bucks a month, and then it's like, well, then you're kind of driving the car for free. Obviously, there's tax implications. Cortez but. has his uh, his payments for free. He's like, yeah, yeah, that's a wash. <laughs> yeah, my car's free. It's a wash. <laughs> <laughs> not free, but that's the way I look at it. Is it kind of pays for some expenses in my life, and then I can focus on. My real estate business. The rest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Take my real estate business and try and reinvest it back into privates or another deal that I might see. So anyways, we can get into that in another episode. Yeah. All right. So I got, you got anything? No. Do you think people will be happy to see me back? I think I'm they, back. the fans always ask, where's Brooke? So <laughs> <laughs> like, we don't care about you. Where's Brooke? No, they <laughs> like Brooke so. We want Brooke back. Uh, there was one guy who goes, where's the hottie? And I'm like, I'm right here. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> Anyways, guys, thanks for watching. We appreciate it. It's been 52 fun episodes and we don't see ourselves slowing down anytime soon. So if you want to follow We're just us. speeding up. Yeah. If you want to follow us on Instagram and TikTok and YouTube shorts, that's where we post the, the short form content that gets the most views. But if you're on YouTube, please like and subscribe. Um, we're almost at 2000 subscribers on YouTube, which isn't a lot, but YouTube is pretty hard game. And then on Spotify or Apple podcasts, leave us a review and, uh, this will help push this content out to more people. So thanks again for watching and we'll see you next week. Take care.